The seal hunt of the late 19th and early 20th centuries was a story of extremes, about men who pushed themselves to the limits of human strength and endurance in one of the most unforgiving places on the planet, the North Atlantic ice fields. Every spring, thousands of desperately poor sealers risked their lives for a small bit of cash. There were also the ice captains, rich and respected, their annual trips north only added to their wealth and their prestige. Behind it all was a handful of powerful merchant firms. They gambled their own investments, but other men's lives, on the commercial seal hunt. It was one of Newfoundland's oldest industries. In the spring of 1793, a St. John's merchant sent two schooners to the North Atlantic ice floes to catch seals. When they returned with 1,600 pelts, an industry was born. The contributions to Newfoundland's economy and society were enormous. Seal oil was an important lighting fuel and found a large market in Britain. Leather and furs were lucrative exports too. By the 1830s, more than 300 schooners and 7,000 men sailed to the ice floes annually. They came from communities all along Newfoundland's north and east coasts. Places like Twillingate, Greens Pond, Fogo, and all throughout Conception Bay. St. John's also participated, but it was Outport Newfoundland that truly flourished during the era of sail. Vessels were built, owned, and crewed locally. But in the 1860s, everything changed. Steamers began to appear at the flows. Large and powerful, they could penetrate deep into the ice fields. Unable to compete, the schooner fleet grew steadily smaller. The changes to the industry were profound. Instead of a swarm of sailing ships, only a couple dozen steamers headed north. Power became concentrated in the few large merchant firms that could afford to buy the expensive steamers. Most were based in St. John's. There were fewer captains too, but they could become fabulously wealthy. A single steamer could hold tens of thousands of pelts. Its master received a large chunk of the profits. In 1910, Captain Abram Kane earned $3,600 at the spring seal hunt more than double what the chief resident physician of the General Hospital made that entire year. The competition to command a steamer was fierce. The ice captains began to apprentice their sons and nephews, an aristocracy emerged and the industry became dominated by a few prominent sealing families, like the Canes, the Bartlett's, and the Blandfords. But the merchants made the most money. By the 1890s, a firm would have earned about $5,000 for every steamer it sent to the flows. Most sent two or more. It was a different story for the sealers. $30 was a typical salary in the late 1800s. By 1920, that number had only risen to $50. It was a small fraction of what the captains and merchants earned during the same six or seven week period. But the sealers were poor, and they needed that money to supplement their income from the summer cod fishery. Most of the men came from outport communities. They traveled to St. John's by rail, horse, and even by foot to find a berth aboard one of the steamers. But even after traveling that distance, they weren't guaranteed a spot. The number of applicants far exceeded the number of tickets, and many men returned home empty-handed. The sealing steamers usually set sail for the ice fields in mid-March. They returned to Newfoundland in late April or early May. The ice flows were vast stretches of floating pack ice that appeared off southern Labrador and northeastern Newfoundland in late February. This map shows the route that one steamer followed. The flows included the coastal ice that winds and tides had carried offshore and large pans of Arctic ice that drifted south on ocean currents. It was on these flows that the Atlantic harp seal herds congregated every spring to give birth. The men called this place the Front. It was a frozen battleground where ships and sealers had to defend against sudden blizzards, thrashing waves, fierce winds, and sea ice powerful enough to smash a steamer to bits. The first to sink was the SS Wolf in 1871, crushed by an iceberg. By 1914, steamer losses had risen to 36. Becoming trapped in tight ice was another problem. A jammed vessel couldn't reach the seal herds, and worse, pressure from the ice threatened to crush its hull. The sealers worked hard to free a jammed vessel. Ropes were thrown overboard and the men tried to drag the ship forward. They jumped and stomped on the ice. 
and they chopped at it with axes, usually getting drenched with freezing water in the process. They also tried to blast the ship free with gunpowder. It was an effective but dangerous method. The process was described by a 17-year-old named A. Stanley Harvey in 1908. First, powder is put into bottles, and then the fuse is set alight. It is then shoved down into the ice, through a hole chopped, by means of poles. After a breathless wait, we hear a rumble, and the ice cracks, sometimes a couple of hundred yards. Then, with a roar, great blocks of ice are hurled with terrific force through the air. Everybody yells out, heads in under! Meanwhile, we scatter here and there to evade the falling ice. It is very exciting. When all is over, long poles are thrown from the ship until every man has one. Then all the slob ice is passed along the ship into her wake. The engines are reversed, and if she moves, the rope from her bow is dropped over and everyone catches hold and pulls her through. If she fails to break the barrier, the process is repeated. One blast blew up some very large pieces of ice, and some fragments fell on two men, cut them considerably, but not seriously. Another blast was shoved too far under the ship and nearly blew her up. Once the captain found the seal herds, he ordered his men off the ship to hunt. Each steamer carried between 100 and 300 men. They were divided into smaller groups of 50 or so sealers. These groups were called watches. A vessel typically dropped off its first watch at daybreak and then steamed away to deposit other watches elsewhere among the flows. This gave the crew greater access to the massive seal herds, but it also meant that the men were rarely within walking distance of their vessel. Miles of ice separated them from their ship and the other watches. Sealers could spend 12 hours or more on the ice before their vessel returned to pick them up. It was a dangerous practice. Sudden storms and fog patches could easily separate the men from their colleagues and from their vessel. Even when the weather was good, a false step on an unsteady ice pan could send an unlucky sealer into the freezing waters. A well-dressed sealer wore a canvas jacket, a wool sweater, heavy trousers, long underwear, a cap, and mittens. He also wore sealskin boots and drove nails into the soles for traction on slippery ice. Some men also wore goggles to block out the bright sunlight and to protect against ice blindness. But not all sealers could afford such an elaborate outfit. Many had to work on the flows in much more flimsy clothing. Sealers also carried their own food onto the ice in a canvas or sealskin knapsack called a nunny bag. Hard bread was a staple. Many sealers also took oatmeal and raisins, which they mixed with melted ice. On board the vessel, the ship's cook made them hot meals and tea. The sealers' equipment included a gaff for killing seals, a knife for skinning the carcasses, and a tow rope for hauling the pelts. The gaff was a two-meter-long wooden pole that had an iron hook and spike attached to one end. The men struck the young seals across their noses to kill them. They also depended on the gaff for safety. It helped them to keep balance on unsteady ice pans and to test the ice to make sure it was strong enough to walk across. Gaffs were also invaluable for rescuing sealers who had slipped into the water. Sealers hauled their pelts to a designated ice pan that was usually marked with the vessel's flag. Each man dropped off about three or five pelts at a time and then returned to the hunt. At the end of each day, the steamer picked up its crew and visited each of its ice pans to retrieve the pelts. Danger was a part of daily life at the flows. Injury, disease, and even death were very real threats. The steamers were filthy and overcrowded. They were home to frequent bouts of dysentery. Smallpox and measles broke out on occasion too. One of the most notorious diseases was known as seal finger. This painful infection was transmitted from the seal pelt to a cut or abrasion on the sealer's hand. A victim's finger became swollen for a few weeks and then healed in a permanently crooked position. Many men had it amputated. On the ice, the sealers were at risk of frostbite, drowning, and freezing to death. If a sealer slipped near his vessel, he could get pinned between its hull and the ice. This happened while A. Stanley Harvey was at the flows in 1908. A very sad accident occurred on the Algerine yesterday. She was stuck, and after getting her free, the usual rush was made for the side sticks. Some poor fellow missed his footing and fell between the ship and ice. Both his legs were crushed, and he died in agony two hours later. It is not all fun out here. Sometimes there was large-scale disaster. In 1898, 
48 men from the SS Greenland froze to death after a sudden blizzard separated them from their ship. There was an even greater loss of life in 1914. That spring, 252 men died in two disasters. One was the sinking of the Southern Cross. It was carrying 173 men and one stowaway when it went down. No one survived. The second disaster involved the crew of the SS Newfoundland. 132 of its sealers spent two days and nights stranded on the North Atlantic ice flows in blizzard conditions. 78 men died. The 1914 sealing disasters placed the industry under intense public scrutiny. The government passed legislation to make the hunt safer. Captains were not allowed to order their men on the ice after dark or in stormy weather. And merchants had to financially compensate the families of any sealer who was injured or killed at the flows. More change came to the industry during the First World War. Some merchant firms handed over their most powerful steamers to the war effort. By the time peace was restored in 1918, the sealing industry was about half the size of what it was in 1914. The steamer fleet grew steadily smaller. By the end of the Second World War, motor vessels dominated the seal hunt. They were cleaner, more efficient, and cheaper to operate than the coal-burning steamers. One by one, the old sealing steamers dropped out of service until only the SS Eagle was left. But it too was destroyed in 1950 when its owners had it sunk just outside the St. John's Narrows. After almost a century, the era of steam had come to an end.